giants entering into negotiations and agreements with Australian news media businesses to pay for original content. This will help sustain public interest journalism in this country for years to come. And it is leading the world in a critical microeconomic reform. I want to pay credit to the Prime Minister who, when Treasurer, initiated this process with the ACCC. To my colleague, Minister Paul Fletcher, for his outstanding work, and to Rod Sims and his hard working team at the ACCC who put together a framework which has formed the basis for the legislation that is now before the Parliament, and it's the Morrison government's intention to pass through the Parliament. And I also want to pay credit to the stakeholders, the digital giants and the news media businesses, for the good faith in which they've entered into these negotiations and how they are working to mutually beneficial agreements. Are there any questions? Treasurer, do, do these deals make your bill somewhat redundant if they're already happening without the legislation? Well, the first thing to say is none of these deals would be happening if we didn't have the legislation before the parliament. This legislation, this world leading mandatory code, is bringing the parties to the table and is helping to, pay, to pave a way forward where news media businesses are getting paid for generating original journalistic content. With respect to the code, it is our intention to make it law. And as you know, the code has a number of fundamental features. Namely, it's mandatory. Uh, secondly, it's based on two-way value exchange. And thirdly, that there's a final offer arbitration model. This code has succeeded where others have tried and failed. And it is a framework, a lasting legal mandatory framework, which is obviously the reason why the parties have come to the table. Treasurer, has the... Where's it going to Parliament? ...designating people under the code uh, in any capacity, either in search or showcase or anything else like its other branches of services? Well, the first thing to say is when we've talked about designation, we've talked about Google and Facebook. And I don't want to preempt any decisions uh, that I may or may not take as the Treasurer to designate a particular digital platform under this code. But what I have said is if commercial deals are in place, then it changes the equation. Because we've always sought a number of objectives here. Firstly, to get commercial agreements to be struck between the parties. And that is work that is currently underway and is looking very promising indeed. The second objective has been to legislate the code. And again, that is our intention in the coming days. And thirdly, we have sought to keep the major players in Australia. As you know, Google had talked about leaving Australia. We never wanted that to be the case. They're an important part of the digital landscape here. But at the same time, we knew that the code was in Australia's national interest and that's why the Prime Minister, Minister Fletcher and myself were absolutely committed to it. Treasurer, you said last week you welcomed the fact that the Senate Committee recommended no changes to mm -hmm. the legislation and then on Monday you announced technical changes would be made. I, I, have you not bowed to the feet of these tech giants after holding these private talks at the weekend? We have held the line and held it strongly and the digital giants have been left in no doubt about the Morrison government's resolve. Well, we worked through these changes with the ACCC, with Treasury, uh, with, uh, within, within government, because they help clarify the code. So, for example, with respect to advance notice of algorithms, they are going to remain with respect to the listing of items on search. That's always been the intention around um, the, uh, the advance notice of algorithms. With respect to 
the arbitrator taking into account the cost of generating original content, we put a reasonableness test around that. But also the two-way value exchange always intended that there would be an understanding that you'd also take into account the cost to the digital platforms of providing that service for the news media to be, uh, to be registered on. So we're making that explicit. With respect to the ACCC, the ACCC was never to be arguing on behalf of one party or another in the arbitration. The ACCC, as an honest broker, is providing information that is relevant to that arbitration, so that will continue to be a case, and we're making that clear. And with respect to lump sum payments, we never intended that if Google reached a deal, or sorry, if the arbitrator was um, overseeing a, a deal between a television station and one of the digital platforms, that they would make that digital platform pay two cents, for example, for every click over the forthcoming year. That was never the intention. The, always the intention was to have a lump sum payment, and that's, again, what we've made explicit in the code. Treasurer, the big organisations, Nine, Seven, News, may well be able to strike deals with Google, but a lot of the suffering has been in regional and suburban newspapers. What will the deal do to make sure that that kind of journalism continues? Well, the first thing is you will see, uh, we hope, and my understanding is a series of deals. Deals with bigger players and smaller players. As you know, we set a threshold for who was eligible under the code and, and, and deals are being worked on between the parties. Secondly, we've made it clear to, to Google and to, and to others that having a default offer in place for some of those smaller players is important as well. And I know they're working constructively and in good faith on that. So Chris, to answer your question very directly, um, there are negotiations going on with all the major players and the minor players at the moment. So the Treasurer, what's this week about, there was some reports this week about you walking back the requirement for these deals to reflect fair value around articles that come up in search. Uh, do you think these Google deals that are being done now reflect fair value for publishers for their articles appearing in search? Well, let's wait and see the detail of those negotiations as the, uh, as the news media businesses make them public and Google make them public uh, in, the coming, in the period ahead. But everything that I have heard from parties, both in the news media business and in terms of the digital platforms, is that these are generous deals. These are fair deals. These are good deals. These are good deals for the Australian media businesses and these are deals that they are making in their, off their own bat with the digital giants. So of course, they're complex, they're varied, they're gonna be of different length and they're obviously gonna be of different quantum. But as I understand it, they're fair deals and they're good deals. Treasurer, once the legislation passes Parliament, via regulation, you have to choose which platforms are designated. That's correct. Now, at the moment, we're seeing Google striking deals. So far, Facebook hasn't struck any deals. Will you be looking more favourably upon which companies, either Google or Facebook, have struck a deal when you determine that designation? And is it possible, for example, that Google could avoid designation but Facebook could get it? Well, again, I don't want to preempt uh, the outcome of these commercial negotiations is currently on foot. Also, the legislation is yet to be uh, passed through the parliament, but it's certainly our hope and our intention for that to be the case. Uh, last weekend was a busy weekend, John. Um, I was heavily involved in discussions, both with uh, Sundar at Google and uh, with Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, and, and obviously in very close contact through the weekend with the Prime Minister and with Minister Fletcher and the ACCC and Treasury. Uh, what became clear to me in those discussions with Google and with Facebook is that they do want to enter into these commercial arrangements. That's their preference. Their preference is to see these commercial arrangements in place. And that's why I think the speed of these negotiations has picked up. So let's wait and see where these negotiations go that everything is pointing in the right direction. Treasurer, if, if a sexual assault occurred Are in your... Any more questions on Google, Facebook? Did, did you just say that the, those changes of informing publishers of algorithm changes won't apply to Facebook? No, I didn't say that. 
I said there's standard provision in the code about notice of changes in algorithms and they relate to um, the listing on search. Sorry. There's no requirement in the code for news businesses to actually spend the money that they obtain under the code negotiations in the newsrooms. Is that a flaw or oversight in the code? Well, again, um, speaking to people in, who run these news media businesses, certainly that is their intention to reinvest in journalism. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, when you look at the ability of, of um, your employers to continue to operate, having this extra revenue stream is going to be very important to the sustainability of public interest journalism. When it comes to the public broadcaster, the ABC, uh, in our conversations um, with its managing director, he has made very clear that the money received in any deals that they strike with the uh, digital platforms will be spent on regional journalism. Have you, have you got the press gallery of pay rise in, Treasurer? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, look, I, I'm not going to jump the gun, John. What I'm going to say is everything I'm hearing and seeing so far is positive for your sector, but more importantly, positive for the country. This is a significant microeconomic reform. We have gone where others have failed to go, and that is putting in place a workable, a binding mandatory code, which we hope passes through the parliament as quickly as possible with bipartisan support. And in the process, we're gonna see journalists and their proprietors are paid for generating that content. Can I ask a question about disclosure laws just briefly? Sure. Are you permanently weakening obligations for company directors to keep their shareholders informed against the advice of ASIC, which wrote to you last year warning that continuous disclosure is fundamental and particularly important during times of market uncertainty and volatility? Well, we've followed the recommendations out of the parliamentary committee that looked into class actions and litigation funders. This is a very important reform and you would have seen today uh, that it has been welcomed um, because what it does do is it ensures that there is still a basis to bring civil actions for breach of the continuous disclosure laws, but there has to be fault. It has to be reckless. It has to be negligent or fraudulent. And that is really important. There's a fault requirement. But we've also left in place the existing law where ASIC can issue infringement notices on a no-fault basis. And that sees Australia adopt a similar position to the US and the UK regulators. So it's really important that we have a balance here where the regulation provides the opportunity for transparency, for accountability, uh, for actions to be brought, but at the same time, it doesn't create an undue burden uh, on the corporate sector. Uh, the no-fault system that was in place previously, yeah. um, capital players overseas say that made Australia a more competitive and compelling place to invest. Are you concerned that by uh, watering down those uh, measures that you're making Australia a less competitive place for overseas capital to invest? Not at all. Yes. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'll take two quick questions and I'll be okay, sure. Um, Giving first home buyers access to um, their superannuation for a deposit, wouldn't that just push up house prices? Well, again, we've done a lot in um, the home uh, space in terms of giving first home buyers an opportunity to enter into the market. Uh, and so we'll continue to roll out those me measures, and I think they've been very successful with respect to super. Um, I introduced into the Parliament some very significant reforms today, uh, reforms that I announced at budget time but reforms that will see the super funds held to account for underperformance, uh, reforms that will uh, ensure that there's a stapling of people's uh, superannuation account as they move jobs or move industries. People are paying $450 million a year uh, in unnecessary fees and charges because they've got duplicate accounts. These reforms that we've introduced to super today build on the other reforms like the opt-in requirements for younger people with respect to insurance in um, super, and getting rid of uh, getting rid of some of the fees, putting a cap on fees for low balance 
accounts, for example, banning the exit fees. Our reform agenda, when it comes to superannuation, has very much been a practical reform agenda. And it might surprise people to know that Australians pay $30 billion a year in superannuation fees. $30 billion a year. That's more in a, than household electricity and gas bills. And our reforms have been designed to reduce the fees in super for Australians, the 16 million Australians who have their super accounts, the $3 trillion that's in Australian super. Does so that reform possibly include allowing people to access super to buy into the property? Well, market? again, um, the, super the super space uh, is a very complex one. There are lots of issues that we are looking at. We've obviously got the Callaghan review as well, which talked about when it came to superannuation, a lot of people were tragically passing away with big balance accounts. So there's a lot of thinking that we are undertaking with respect to super, but we do have significant reforms before the parliament. And with respect to uh, first home buyers, um, we have a lot of um, practical programs that we've rolled out. The economist I've been speaking with this morning are worried that there's a, a pattern of rolling lockdowns that's mm. emerging in Melbourne and that this will damage the state and the, and the city's ability to rebound in the coming 12 months. It will mean the state and the city are lag for national recovery. Is, do you share this concern and what, what can the government do? Well, this is great news that Victoria uh, is coming out of lockdown. More than 6 million Victorians have been subject to a statewide lockdown and it's hit people pretty hard. Uh, and uh, my family's like so many others that have gone through this. Um, so I w welcome the news from the Premier that Victorians are coming out of lockdown. When it comes to the economy, uh, yes, this dense confidence, there's no doubt about that. And yes, it costs businesses uh, and households a lot of money. I was speaking to one restaurateur recently, he told me as a result of this recent lockdown, he lost $50,000 in food, 120 dozen oysters he had to throw out. He was expecting a bumper weekend, had hundreds of bookings. He had Valentine's Day, Chinese New Year, people going to the tennis. Uh, and tens of thousands of dollars he spent on wages of chefs that were cooking in the days leading up to the weekend where trade was cancelled. So you go into lockdown, a statewide lockdown, it has a massive economic impact, not to mention the emotional effect and the emotional impact on, on people and all those kids uh, who couldn't go to school over the course of this week. So I welcome the news out of Victoria, I welcome zero cases, uh, and when it comes to our economic support, it's ongoing. Yes, JobKeeper is coming to an end in March, but as we saw in the recent economic data, there are 2.1 million fewer Australians and 520,000 fewer Australian businesses that are on JobKeeper in the December quarter compared to the period prior, and we have a whole lot of other economic supports that are rolling out. Last question. No, I don't. Who asked me about the Barnaby Joyce amendments? How's the government going to deal with the CFC bill? And do you sympathise with Angus Taylor dealing with the NATS revolt? Look, I, I support a reliability fund, uh, and I, I don't support those amendments. Labor calling for an independent review into the Cochrane Parliament House, and and what we've just heard about this week. Is that something the government would consider? Can we expect Labor and the government to work together on this? And if not, why? what's the issue with having an independent review separate from the party? Well, the Prime Minister uh, made a very clear statement to Parliament yesterday. Uh, he pointed out that obviously uh, we've got our own internal processes uh, underway. Uh, and uh, Celia Hammond, a, a colleague of mine who's been Vice-Chancellor of the University of Notre Dame, has got experience of dealing uh, with a number of um, workplace issues in the institutional setting is going to be working with uh, with colleagues. We've got the Deputy Secretary in the Department of um, Prime Minister and Cabinet, Stephanie Foster, who will also be conducting a review. And the Prime Minister was positive about what he heard uh, from the Leader of the Opposition yesterday and we'll uh, be taking that further with not just the Leader of the Opposition but also uh, with, uh, with um, the other leaders of the of the other parties but these allegations are very serious they're very serious allegations uh, and that's why the prime minister has um, put forward a, a number of new processes i think there's a, a recognition on both sides of the political divide that the culture 
in this place has to improve and improve fast. And we want to help that happen. And by working across the political divide, taking any politics out of this matter, I think we can make progress. But at the end of the day, we're all here in Australia's Parliament House and the rest of the country looks to our example. So we have to meet the highest standards in this place because if we don't meet the highest standards in this place, then that's not a good example for the rest of Australia. Thank you very much.